set to zero, and the stream has not heard anything I've been saying, which has happened several times before. Sorry about that. Hi, stream. Welcome to our pitch workshop. I'm just going over the basics of it right now, so you're right on time. So our week one starts next week on the 10th with Scott Barkin. That's going to just all be about organization, making sure that you can get kind of the tent poles like uh, in place for your pitch. It doesn't have to be perfect by the end of this week, but the idea is that you will be learning how to pitch through this workshop, and by the end, you will have like a, probably a pretty solid around two-minute pitch if you stick with the class milestones and attend all the classes. So um, you should also be ready to read a pro script from the blacklist this week and be ready to talk about it, or at least um, to explain the basics of the plot in a concise and to-the-point way. So... Um, you, you got to be able to sort of pitch not just scripts that you yourself have written or are planning to write, but also be able to like synthesize and summarize stories in general. That's like a big part of just write, writing for Hollywood is not just, again, writing things by yourself secluded in your room. So much of this is about being able to quickly and efficiently communicate stories. Um, which means you don't want to be that, you know, your my, my great uncle at your family reunion telling the same story for the ninth time going on and on about irrelevant details and tangents. And like by the end, we're just like, wait, what was this? What was this even about again? You this is a, a skill that you will really notice when people don't have it, especially in, you know, day to day life when you're interacting with people who aren't professional storytellers. And, you know, people tell stories all the time. Um, some people are good at it and some people aren't. And there are really distinct skills that kind of separate how do you tell anecdotes and how do you summarize stories? Because that's what anecdotes basically are. They are summarized stories. Um, and, you know, the difference between an anecdote and the whole saga is the fact that we've identified just what's interesting about these events, about the people who went through it, about whatever it is that happened. Um, you're able to just find, oh, this is the story of what happened this one time to this one person. You very quickly get through it and express and focus on really what's interesting about that. Whereas the conflict, you find that um, the, the the points of interesting conflict that we can we will sort of imagine the hero being able to struggle with these obstacles without having to out specifically outline what every single obstacle will be. You're going to be kind of like, you don't have to go through the entire story. Um, you can. There's like multiple types of pitches. There's the pitch that goes through the whole thing. And then there's the pitch that you basically just kind of go up until like the midpoint and then suggest the trajectory of the rest of the story. That's what you're mostly going to be focusing on. So you should um, be ready to read a script this week. We have a link to all the blacklists so you can um, pick many, many, many different ones to choose from um, and be thinking of how you would concisely summarize the story in, you know, between one to two minutes, just focusing on the important things. So week two is going to be performance, where you're going to refine your project pitch to incorporate a short bio or personal connection with the story if you have one. This is a little bit more important for TV, wherein it's so much more about like the, what you yourself are bringing to the room, your own experience and background and upbringing and unique like view of the world. So um, we're going to read a TV p pilot script and sort of be ready to pitch that. You can kind of pretend like you are the one that wrote it for the purposes of, like, what's your connection to this? And if you really don't have a connection, you can kind of just make one up for the purposes of this class and just practice getting good at communicating what that connection might have been. Um, advanced techniques on the 24th will refine this pitch to incorporate necessary details about the world and the character is really just fleshing this out as much as possible within the walls and boundaries of the time frame, because remember, we can't go much beyond two minutes you will be hard cut off at three minutes. I will like interrupt to say your time is over at three minutes. Um, that might seem like that's not very much time, but you quickly see that if people are really good at this, three minutes is way more time than you need. So um, a lot of this is going to be about cutting things away that don't work or that, or that are irrelevant or that are not contributing to the main crux of the A story, which is where you want your focus to generally be. So. You're going to prepare that final version of your project pitch in preparation for May 1st, which is going to be the sort of like, I don't know, the recital, <laughs> the showcase, whatever you call it, um, for this kind of thing, where we will have Connor Rowan on and he will hear pitches and, and um, talk about how the writer's room kind of works um, and uh, can give you some good insight on that. So he's really good with TV and that's going to be his focus and specialty. My specialty and Scott, is, uh, we're really, really into features. Um, Morgan is really into plays. We might get her as a guest host for one of these. So um, 
we all have different kind of like skill sets and different things that we're good at, but there's always going to be at least one of our instructors who can like um, tell you what to focus on for your idea a little better. So, um, how to enroll. You can either purchase this bootcamp on its own, scriptcamp.net slash classes. You don't have to do that now, but before next weekend, you should. Or you can start a free trial for unlimited membership at scriptcamp.net slash membership. And with that unlimited membership, you get access to all classes, all bootcamps, <coughs> all labs. That's over 60 hours of classes a month, private Discord channels, video library, which you can go back and watch pre recordings of previous classes. We have like dozens of hours of classes in the video library and on our various social media sites at this point. So even if you're not attending the live stuff, you can always look back at stuff you've missed or just get a preview of what they do in other kinds of classes. Um, and then uh, you can also sign up for basic, which is just $5 a month. It does not include the bootcamp courses or the labs, um, but you can still attend the, you know, there's still eight free classes a month you can take. There are still private Discord channels, um, and uh, you'll just be help helping to support Script Camp for the cost of, what, a cup of coffee a month? Um, eight classes for the cost of a cup of coffee, I think is pretty good. So um, we also have this coaching tier, which... Our slots are currently full for, um, but we'll may potentially be opening again soon, so we will let you know about that. Um, so uh, let's, before we get in, just talk about sort of what are your goals as a writer. Everyone here, I'm assuming, wants to write for Hollywood in some capacity, but um, let's just go down and outline specifically what you're trying to do. Let's take a look at the chat. And um, feel free to weigh in on text or voice. Yeah, we got a comment that says your audio isn't working, can't hear us, you can hear you on Discord, but YouTube is muted. Yeah, it should be fixed by now. So, anyone want to weigh in and tell us what your goals are for being a writer? Why is my camera black now? I'll fix the camera. Feel free to weigh in. Anyone? Um, sure. Right now, my goal is just to get better at writing and, um, you know, try to turn some of these uh, ideas into finished scripts <laughs> in my backlog. Cool. Um, yeah, it looks like we're getting some spam in the YouTube chat. That's a little strange. Um, we're not interested in naked HD online strips without clothing um, unless you're able to pitch them in a compelling way. So feel free to come by Spambot and um, pitch your, <laughs> I don't know, erotic film to us if you really want to. But it's got to have a strong second act or else we're not interested. Um, so I am trying to just uh, fix my camera here, but I am still here. Don't worry. Um, and uh, Nacho was saying that you're trying to just build your skills right now, which is probably the mm -hmm. best thing that you can be doing. I mean, you're, if, if you're, no matter what your overall goal as a writer is, just keep in mind that it takes like a really long time to actually get good at this and that you need to invest a significant amount of time into doing that before anyone's going to be ready to rep you or buy anything from you or even really to read an entire script from you. You have to put in a fair amount of work at the very top. Um, so that could be years of work. Um, and I don't think I'm able to talk and fix my webcam at the is, same time, is, so let, go ahead. Is the little, um, the little eyeball may have a little cross on the eyeball? No, it was, um, it was a problem I was having before uh, with, you know what, I might just be able to copy the stream chat over into my other scene, this one here, and then, nope, never mind. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, so I'll try to fix that soon, but um, let's... Uh, bring up the text here in case anybody wants to hacky sack time says Micah all right so hacky sack you know if you've got a compelling hacky sack feature film pitch then we're willing to hear it um but uh yeah so you should focus on primarily on building your skills which is why classes like this are a good place to be um would you say that ultimately you want to be a feature or tv writer though Nacha? um yeah i mean i'm more interested in features gotcha. um but yeah. Um, yeah, there's, th sure. there's nothing wrong with setting. You can have that goal, like, for the... You should should have some kind of, like, direction or goal to, to what you're doing. Obviously, building your skills is really important, but you can say, like, yeah, I want to be a feature writer, and, like, I'm on the on the road to, to doing that. Um, and, like, just working on your skills and building up a strong portfolio 
of three to five just uniquely amazing undeniably good scripts is just always going to be the first step to doing that as well as just building the skills like pitching taking and receiving no or like giving and taking notes things like that that you can just work on in the meantime to make sure that by the time that you get that portfolio amassed or aggregated of like really good scripts then you actually have the other skills to kind of allow you to move forward and, and like back up the writing with the the other elements that are really important too Anyone else? Micah says, I'm interested in TV. Um, feel free to elaborate if you'd like. Anyone else? got a bunch of very quiet students here in what is supposed to be a pitching class where you are working on this very social job of being a screenwriter or a tv writer so i would encourage you to speak up and like it i know it can be a little weird to weigh in on online classes it's like i'm just talking to a computer but uh that's this is what it's like to work in the in the biz you got to do a lot of talking so Micah says, I'm interested in TV. It's always been about consistent, interesting story worlds. Would you like to unmute and tell us more about that? Yeah, I've, I, I always try to do the thing that nobody does. Cool. Can you, and that's, you that's like, that? that's, that's like kind of my whole thing with writing is that, yeah, I figured out that if, if you do certain, if you, there are certain ideas, certain things, certain certain tropes, if you will, that people haven't really thought about as well as they could have or haven't really considered in a certain way or haven't really... Yeah, and that's, that's pretty much what I do. That's great. Yeah, that's kind of how I, I... I really tried to do that at the start of my career, and I'm always drawn more towards doing that kind of stuff myself. Um, it's not always the best business sort of decision to, to try to... like. It is not good business. Um, but it's great art. But, uh, yeah, I mean, like, when I, the script that I first broke in with, I was like, literally no one would write this story. It's too dark. It's too messed up. Nobody would watch, essentially, a, like, horrific adventure about a bunch of kids in a real war zone. Um, but then that script got me meetings all over town and um, got me repped for the first time. And like, uh, I was like, oh, I guess that actually is the kind of thing you should be doing is the stuff that you're like, wait, no one would do that, though. Right. <laughs> so that I mean, obviously, you have to have the skills to back up the ability to do something that no one else has done, because the danger becomes yeah. why has no one done it before? Like the, the question because ask is like they're afraid or because they're afraid of doing it the wrong way, which is always a challenge not to do. That yeah, exactly. So that um, you have to, yeah. you always have to ask this question of why has no one done it? And the answer might be, people have just been too touchy or afraid to get it wrong. That might be. The yeah, answer. and I think that the reason why nobody's done a European post-apocalypse series, or nobody's done a real, a non-Russia. I don't know, not just, not more than just Russia or Scandinavia or just the whole of Europe is because Europe is kind of, yeah, Europe's a touchy zone, zone of conflict, potentially. Yeah, that, that might be the case. Um, I mean, like, depending on the year, it's going to be very different political situations yeah. and things like that to consider, which, you know, th these things do matter. The, these, like... Um, scripts with uh that, that touch on real world locations or real world conflicts or might like tread on people's toes in that kind of way can be kind of tricky to tackle at times um so yeah. you always got to look at why has no one done this before and um the answer might be because no one wants to see it <laughs> so or the answer might also be because it's impossible to actually pull that off um obviously nothing is really impossible to pull off and you have to like you, you have to just get you have to just try stuff to get better at finding that line between no one has done this because it's impossible or no one has realized how cool and amazing this would be if it was done right. So it's it's a tough balancing act when you're trying to do stuff that no one's done before. And although I myself do gravitate towards mm -hmm. a challenge, I'm always trying to find something that like will be difficult to do in some kind of way. Like I just wrote an ensemble movie for the first time with 12 main characters, which I'd never done before and is like so That's hard funny. to keep track of. Um, but I just I gravitate towards it because I'm like, 
the fact that that's difficult will make me want to pull it off more. So you use it to like yeah. motivate yourself and you use it to like at the beginning of your career, especially it doesn't matter if it's going to sell or not. You just have to try stuff and you just have to finish stuff. You just have to do what you're good at. And yeah, anyway, background for sure. Yeah. Do what you're good at. And by just trying stuff, you'll find what you're good at. Um, let's see what else we have. Willow says, would love to be a TV writer, but feel it's unrealistic. I write to improve and become consistent, maybe good enough to produce my own material. Um, do you want to expand on this, Willow? Why do you feel it's unrealistic? There's lots of TV writers. So, uh, it kind of hard to explain um for one thing i i love reading and i have a very very hard time reading i, I love writing but it's very very difficult for me uh to read and i feel that reading in any kind of a writing profession is imperative Yes, you're absolutely right. The only way to become a fantastic writer is to become a fantastic reader, um, meaning that you might have to, like, um, if, if you do struggle to read, like, an entire document um, in one sitting, that's, like, a skill that you have to work on and, and, and build up to. Um, it's not that you have to read it. You, you can take breaks. Like, it's not that you have to read everything in an uninterrupted sitting, but just keep in mind that, like, the experience of the script is meant to mimic the experience of watching the movie or the TV show, um, meaning that, like, this is supposed to feel kind of just like a one-to-one -one version of what we're doing on screen. So it's it's intended to be experienced in one sitting. So, like, um, I would recommend maybe, like, set a time, set aside a time, maybe just, like, an hour each day and make that just the reading time. A lot of people like to read before bed or things like that. There's apps that make it easier. Try Weekend Read um, on your phone, which can, like, we're just a lot more used to reading on our phones and scrolling nowadays. So that can sometimes be a little easier for some people. Maybe it's easier if you print them out. Um, some people like to do that, even though it can be, you know, a lot of ink and a lot of pages. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of ways that you can sort of just like train yourself to get better with with reading because you're right, it is absolutely such an important skill. But at least TV, you know, you're just dealing with 30 pages to 60 pages as opposed to reading movies that are going to be 100 plus usually um or i mean not even let alone books and you should be reading everything if you want to be a writer you should be reading books fiction and nonfiction. you should be reading scripts consistently at least one every single week pilots features genres you like genres you don't like all kinds of things um anyone else want to weigh in On our streams, you can also comment. We can see your uh, text comments, at least. All right, let's move on for now. Um, so our next slide is going to be just some things before we get started. The first is, obviously, we are not able to buy or produce your script, and that is not the goal of this course. You're not pitching to us or to me, at least, for the purposes of acquiring something. And that's not the goal, and you shouldn't, like, that will very rarely be on the table. Um, the course is for fun and for refinement of your ideas and for learning how to pitch better. So be prepared to hear your movie idea does not work. If it's already perfect, there's no need to bring it to a workshop. So um, we are looking for original, clear, high concept pitches that bloom in the mind to suggest a compelling movie. You can do a pilot as well. But if you do a pilot, I don't want to hear about the rest of the series. I don't want to hear about anything else that's not going to be in that first script. Like, at the end of it, I might ask questions that ask, like, oh, so where does that kind of go in the show? And you can, like, have a general idea. But you do not need to work out an entire season. You do not need to work out multiple seasons. You don't have to have a plan for advancement of episodes or anything that will pay off way later. You only need to focus on that pilot. So sort of pretend like that pilot is an entirely self-contained story because no one's going to read beyond just a pilot. Um, so if you're doing a pilot, do not lean on material that is outside of the scope of just that initial episode. Um, so we want, and so, and I, again, my preference is movies. So if you, if you have to choose between, you're like, which one do I do? Should I do a pilot or should I do a movie? Pick the movie with me at least. Uh, if you have a TV episode, maybe wait till Connor's class to, to other Connor. Our names are both Connor. His has two ends. Mine has one. Um, but maybe wait till his class to, to, for the, for the TV idea. But in, in any case, 
um, movies are going to be preferable and just a little easier to pitch because it's a complete story, or theoretically a complete story. This can be something you've written already, or it can be something that you haven't written yet, and it's just an idea that you have. Either one's fine. Remember that uh, you might hear, this story doesn't really work, and then you might look at, oh, that's something I already wrote. Shoot, uh, and now I've just, this has turned sort of from pitch refinement into just story diagnosis for the thing that I already have. Um, so just be prepared to hear that if you're going to come with something that you've already written. Um, it might be evident just from hearing the pitch that there are significant story problems in the rest of the document. So we want to start with title and genre. And each of these are kind of like one step at a time. So title, genre, and then comps are clarification of tone if needed. It's not always needed. So this would be where you would say this is, you know, Forrest Gump uh, meets Aladdin. Wow, that sounds kind of good. It's almost like a character traveling around through the different stories in the, like stumbling through the different stories in the Arabian Nights. That'd be kind of cool. Um, so this is where you would list two things that, like two stories that it's comparable to. At least one of them should be in the medium that your thing is. So if you're pitching a movie, it should not be two TV shows. If you're pitching a TV show, it should not be two movies. Um, and uh, or like one of them can be something else sometimes. Like one of them could be a video game. One of them could be a play. One of them could be, you know, a web series or, or something that ideally people know. The comps are not a good spot to sort of show off obscure knowledge. Like if the person doesn't know what you're, what you're comping, then it just falls flat. It's not like you get bonus points. Um, so try to pick something that you think that they will know. Pick something that you think a 19-year-old intern would know is how I should kind of put this. So that can include more elemental stuff from the past. Like you would have to expect that a 19-year-old intern would know Back to the Future, even if that was, you know, came out way before they were born or whatever. But that's like, you got to know that if you want to work in Hollywood. So certain like really, really popular stuff from the past is totally fine. But if it's like much more specific, then just think, will a 19-year-old intern who's reading this know what that is? Um, the cl clarification of tone might be, this is a monster movie, but with like, a fun sort of jokey tone like Tremors as opposed to something like you know A Quiet Place which does not have a, a jokey tone at all um, so it might require like just the understanding the idea might require you to clarify what the tone is a little bit um, looks like we have uh, some comments from Twitch thanks for stopping by fan fictioneer guy he says I've always wanted to create my own TV show or animated web series uh, let's bring that comment into the chat whoop um, and then, I don't know why it doesn't have the top comment there, but he says, uh, oh no, never mind, that's just the Twitch message. He arrives with a face plant from a silver portal surrounded by swarms of silver letters, numbers, and symbols. Wow, okay. Never seen those little messages before, but cool. All right, great. So you want to be a TV writer or create your own TV shows. That's definitely something that's possible in the future. Um, like, that definitely takes many, many years of working to get to that point, but it's fine to have an ambitious goal, and in fact, you should have an ambitious goal because the only way you're going to actually achieve the ambitious goal is by being really dedicated towards it and by knowing what that goal is so it's totally cool if you want to create your own tv or, or animated shows before it means you should obviously be working on your other skills like drawing or animating short cartoons on your own maybe building up a web following with um social media like uh youtube or something like that he likes to enter dramatically thanks fan fictioner um, but yeah, so if you want to be a cartoonist and you want to be creating animated shows, be working on short cartoons. Like, be work, always be making short versions of the thing that you ultimately want to make. And, and I will say, don't get too hung up on any one idea. You have to, like, one of the biggest skills that no one really tells you that you need to build is the skill of letting things go in order to be a professional writer. Because if you spend all your energy and put all your effort into one story or into one script or into one animation or anything like that then you're just not going to build the skills or the body of work that you need in order to improve and to show that you can actually like do this on the scale that you would need to if you were a professional at it so you have to like act like a professional and treat it like it's a job by producing as much of that content as you can not everything's going to be perfect so don't get hung up for for years and years on anything like you shouldn't be spending much longer than you know, four to maybe maximum of six months on any one script or piece of visual media that you're going to be writing. Like, obviously, if you're drawing a cartoon by hand, that might take years. If you're writing books, that might take several years, like up, up to a couple years. Um, but if you're writing scripts, don't spend spend much longer than six months on them for the most part. Like, if, if you're taking longer than that, then it might be that you need to change up your process because if you're going to be a pro feature or TV writer, you need to be able to write faster than that. So... Like, it's okay if your first couple take that long, maybe, but try to build your skills to the point where you can write and execute feature ideas in 8 to 12 weeks 
TV ideas in, you know, six to ten weeks, like around that, around three months at the most. Um, okay, so uh, let's go over the rest of these before we get started. Ground rules and just learning how to pitch. So you start with the title and genre, always. How do you pick the genre? How do you know what genre it is? Well, you should know how genres work uh, to, to some level just by having watched and consumed media your whole life. Genres are just calibrating our expectations for the kind of stuff that will be in that story. It might include the subject matter, or it might include certain tropes in terms of structure, or like certain character archetypes, or things like that. So there's nothing wrong with leaning into genre, but make sure you're not just giving us a just like make sure your story doesn't just sound like a description of the genre and actually feels like a unique entry in that genre. So if you're like a uh, grizzled detective has to is given a a, a missing persons case by a seductive, mysterious woman, and now he gets embroiled in a web of crime as he tries to solve the case. It's like you've just described the noir genre. You haven't actually given us a unique take on it. So um, make sure we're looking for specificity. Um, specificity and uniqueness and originality to some extent. It doesn't have to be blindingly original. I mean, I'd rather ultimately that you be able to put together a well-baked hamburger rather than an experimental, you know, lobster souffle ice cream on a triangle-shaped plate or whatever. But um, you should be looking for something that makes it stand out and makes someone go, oh, even as a fan who has seen a lot of those or read a lot of those, because you have to assume your audience has seen or read a lot of what you're trying to do, um, they will still say, oh, I've got to see that one. I've got to check that one out. Like, imagine they have hundreds and hundreds of options of what to watch or what to read, or, you know, you have dozens of scripts that you're supposed to get through. Why would they give yours extra attention if it doesn't feel like it stands out and is unique and interesting and, and, and visceral and gripping in whatever way that that genre needs to be, then um, why would they give their time to you? There's a quote I just read the other day. I, gosh, I'm forgetting who this was from at this point now. Somebody should Google this, but it's like, the audience is there to, there to give you your attention for as long, or sorry, your job is to entertain the audience for as long as they are willing to give you their attention. Um, and that's like kind of a big ask. Do you know how many things people can distract themselves with nowadays or how many really, really incredible pieces of media they just haven't gotten around to because they haven't felt like it? Like, you don't have to make everything you write comp comparable to, you know, like Citizen Kane or it doesn't have to be better than Hemingway or anything like that. But imagine that they are a fan of this genre that you are offering to them. And that means that they have seen lots and lots of those things and your thing needs to stand out and say to someone who is a fan of that, oh, I've got to check that one out. So that comes down to often like just the idea phase, just the pitching part might tell you which stories are gonna be kind of worth writing and worth investing all this time into and uh, they're worthy of asking someone to invest their time into. Um, so it's a, big, it's a big imposition and a big task for us to ask someone, hey, spend an hour at least reading this, um, possibly multiple hours. Um, asking for hours of someone's time is not something you do super lightly, and it must be done with the confidence that you have delivered something to them that is going to entertain them, maybe give them something to think about afterwards, and it's going to stand out and be memorable and a good time. And that is a, that is a, a broad set of complicated skills. That's many different skills combined into one that you need to synthesize in order to be a professional writer. So, um, title and genre first, comps and clarification of tone. So next is the log line. Now, we have had whole classes and workshops on how to do log lines, but, and there's recordings of those up as well if you want to check them out, but um, also just watch the previous recording of the pitch workshop if you want to see some log lines here. Um, oh, it looks like we have some more comments from Mr. Fanfiction Man. He says, I planned up to season seven of my TV show, yet I've not finished the script for my two part pilot episode. Hmm. My series is 3D CGI based. The camera style has found footage and it's photorealistic, mostly photorealistic. Uh, okay, so yeah, this is what I was talking about before. No one's gonna read beyond a pilot. So unless you're gonna make the whole thing on your own, then there's no point planning out seven seasons of something for the most part. Um, if you're gonna be really handcrafting and making every element of yourself, uh, of this by yourself, then perhaps that might be worth your time, but that's a massive undertaking. And if you haven't even finished the script for the pilot, you I think you know where you need to be focusing your efforts. Remember, that no one's gonna read beyond a pilot. Um, people will only watch beyond a pilot if you're making it yourself, if it's fantastic and undeniably amazing. Um, and if you don't even have a finished script for it, it's tough to imagine that it would be ultimately compelling because we need to, uh, you need to 
We need to have a smaller version of that that people can watch it and start out with and be introduced to this, you know, this world and these characters. And you need to show that you have the foundations of creating effective drama and narrative before people are going to be willing to invest, you know, many hours of their time into what you're doing. Um, okay, so uh, what else? So we have the title and genre. We have a log line, which is often for a movie going to be along the format of, you know, when an inciting incident occurs, when catalyst happens, catalyst and inciting incident being pretty much the same thing, uh, your adjective protagonist, this adjective being chosen carefully to show why you've chosen this person for this story, they must do conflict or else or before stakes. One sentence whenever possible. You can do two sentences, it's not that big a deal, but almost every time I see two sentences, I'm like, you could have made that one sentence like 90% of the time. So um, that's what a logline basically is for a TV pilot. Remember, don't give me the broad scope of the whole show. I just want to know about the pilot. You're going to wait for clarifying questions on just the logline before you move on. So there may be things that are immediately standing out as I already don't understand, and that's a big problem. Um, but uh, that's you're not going to get like scolded or anything. It's a class to learn how to do this better. So it's okay to have those problems, and we will tell you about them and help you fix them. Um, so you should wait for those questions and then move into the pitch part, which you're going to have one to two minutes to tell us more. You don't have to go through every single beat of the story, and you don't have to tell us all the way through to the ending. You're kind of making like a verbal trailer and explaining why this specific journey will be fun and interesting. And you can basically stop like around the midpoint and suggest the trajectory of the remainder. So you're going to tell us like the kinds of obstacles that they're going to face on their way to the final goal. Then we're going to end that with more questions and conversation and feedback and give you up to, you know, potentially up to 15 minutes for a student, depending on how many pitches that we'll be getting. Um, so Nacho, yeah, thanks Nacho. The free TV pilot class is May 8th, followed by the six week, six week TV pilot camp. Uh, fan fiction asks, is this just a presentation stream? My bad. No, you're fine. These are, this is a public free introduction to a course that's starting next week. So you can, this goes for the next hour and 15 minutes. You can stay here and, and participate as much as you want. Um, but, uh, if you want to join, you can go to scriptcamp.net and sign up. So if you're just joining us, thanks for coming in. Uh, we are still going over the basics of how to pitch and looking at kind of the skills that will be necessary in the course and the steps for how to pitch a movie idea. Um, so uh, what do we do after the uh, we tell the story basically to the middle? Yeah, again, you want to suggest the kind of stuff that we'll be doing, and then they have to compete with this on their way to that. So wait for more questions and conversation and feedback at the end. You'll have some time to clarify things that I'm not clear on, or if there's holes that seem evident in the plot, or if we just need more specificity or clarity on anything, this is just a time for you to get feedback. And remember, one of the skills to be working on at all times, but especially if you want to be a Hollywood writer, is the ability to gracefully receive notes. That might not sound like a skill, but it absolutely is a skill. The ability to take and synthesize and like think about notes, even if your first reaction, and it is for a lot of people, first reaction is to say no 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 that's that's not right that's wrong like you don't get it you're not seeing this or this or this you have to sort of be able to like sometimes the note will not be right or whatever sometimes that answer will be evident and you'll say well in my mind what i was trying to do was something like this and you can always like you, you don't have to like fully agree with everything but even if you don't the best response to any note is what any student weigh in and tell us what the best response to any note is thank you Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I'll think about how to make that work. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> um, something along those lines that uh, just says, I appreciate you giving this to me and giving me your time and attention and putting the work into like understanding my story. I may not have gotten everything 100% clear, but I will think about what you've given me and use that to improve it as much as I can. That is like the gist of how you want to be responding by default to any note. Obviously, if sometimes you're like, hmm, I think I actually did answer that in some kind of way, and here's how. You can like kindly and respectfully say so, but ultimately, if you don't know what else to say, or even if you completely disagree, you should just say, thanks, I'll think about that. Like, that's really it. Um, so uh, work on that. And, and like, you gotta be developing your social skills at the same time as developing just your writing skills because writers with bad social skills will not get hired or at least they won't get rehired for anything and they certainly won't be able to stay with a manager very or with a rep team very long um okay so uh let's look at our next slide here and look at some tips so remember to lead with comps or this brief explanation of the tone if that's going to drastically affect how we're going to be imagining the rest of that story so if 
um, you get to the end of the pitch and then you're like, oh, but by the way, it's a really fun kind of wacky jokey tone, then we'll be like, wait, I was imagining the whole thing wrong the whole time, so make sure you've deleted that stuff. Um, you got to make sure that you've laid out the story's walls, like the time frame, the boundary is a ticking clock that's pushing us through this. If this is going to be like a contained thriller, for instance, like what location is this taking place in that suggests, excuse me, unique kind of games and unique things that we can do in that arena or in that space. Um, so, you don't, yeah, you find like time frame, physical location, what are the boundaries at all of this? Don't make it feel like it's going to be a vague story or one that is going to be taking place over the course of years with no motivation or urgency to it. Um, urgency is really important in cinematic storytelling. Don't include background or context that is not totally essential. I thought of this with my dad while we were building Legos one time. Um, probably not really relevant. Don't use character names. We're not going to remember the character names. Unless it is based on a real person or public domain character, so it's going to be, you know, a Benjamin Franklin story, then you can use that. But uh, in general, we will. you don't need to tell us a special forces operative named Jack Chalmers needs to, like, we don't care what his name is. We just don't. <laughs> and we're not going to remember it. Um, more tips. Focus on the main character. The only character you will probably mention in the logline is the protagonist and maybe the antagonist of a central relationship. You can get, like, a little tiny bit into those things during the pitch, but uh, if you find yourself talking too much about side characters, then you're probably getting way off track and using your time unwisely. Ask yourself, why this specific protagonist? You need to imply this internal journey that will sort of intertwine with the external one. Let's look at this example from Reddit. I'm sorry if this is you, but this is from a long time ago, so I assume it's not you. Um, a purge-type society where every day at midnight, a random citizen is chosen to be publicly hunted for a bounty a man becomes the target and must escape it's like okay that's a clear hook as to what the story is but why that guy there's nothing that connects him emotionally to what's going on there's nothing that suggests that he is going to have to go on some kind of internal journey of learning oh why is this society flawed in general um you have a lot of sci-fi stories will start with the main character being the sort of poster boy for that system in whatever way and then being as they sort of realize how, what the system's failings are the audience is sort of seeing where those weaknesses are as well so that's one way to do it, but like always be thinking, why this person? Why couldn't it have been anyone? Why is it just a guy? Um, so th think of what can make that journey particularly uphill or ironic in some kind of way. You know, if the greatest example, if the shining beacon of that society becomes the target of it, that's a clear ironic journey, like Minority Report, right? The main character is like the most badass cop ever in this world of the future where psychics predict crime before it even happens. And then when he the prediction comes out that he is going to be the next killer, he starts to lose faith in the system and see flaws in the world that he couldn't have seen before he becomes, like, he is forced to go from the highest point of it to the lowest point of it. So there is a very clear ironic journey there that you really need in order to make those stories work. Motivation and urgency. It should be clear that your character has to act and why, and the conflict should come with the highest possible stakes or consequences. It shouldn't, if it's a movie, it shouldn't feel episodic, like a series of unconnected situations, and it shouldn't feel overly internal, like it's just going to be about people sitting around and thinking about stuff, or talking about stuff, or trying to understand stuff, or the words, words like decides to, or must come to terms with, things like this are going to indicate a lack of urgency in the story. So, uh, common issues. No hook or journey. It's an idea for an idea. Like, how about a one-take action movie like 1917, but it takes place in Vietnam? That's so vague that it's not even ready for a workshop. There's no main character. There's no specific conflict. There's no goalpost. There's no central relationship. There's, like, pretty much nothing here. It's an idea for an idea. Let me pause really quick and just ask to see if we have questions on anything that we've talked about so far before I go over the rest of these common issues. Questions on anything we've talked about? Okay, no questions, let's move on. So, more common issues. No clear hook. What is a hook? A hook is the thing that says, this sets apart from the standard things you might expect from the genre in this clear and easily summarizable way. Um, so, it, it, otherwise you run the risk of a story just sounding down the middle, which is meaning that it sounds like just any generic bo like DVD box that you pick up from a bargain bin. It's gonna just sound like, oh, that just sounds like you're telling us what happens in the genre normally. When her family is murdered, a Brooklyn housewife must hunt down the killers and get revenge. It's like, what's the hook? That she's from Brooklyn? I don't really get it. Um, how is this going to inform the unique tactics that she uses, her unique connection to what's going on? 
the themes of the movie, the conflict of the movie, anything. Like, this just sounds like any revenge movie to me. Um, so don't make your movie sound like just any version of itself. And then what syndrome is really common to. It's a clear hook, but not a clear journey. Remember, a, a movie idea is a character, a hook, and a journey. And you kind of need all three of those things. What's the actual goalpost? A goalpost is a tangible thing that the character needs to accomplish or get or destroy or anything like that. Often a MacGuffin is added to stories, a MacGuffin being this plot device that's like, I don't know, the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. It's just a thing that the characters need to get or to do. It's a plot important object or something like that. Sometimes a MacGuffin can be a person or things like that. But you see the, the idea being that's just used for to give the plot some sense of really clear direction. Um, so it, it's what it's what helps you find the journey. So look for what is that actual goalpost, right? A depressed guy moves into a haunted house with seven demons, each one representing a deadly sin. They're all trying to help him get back on his feet. Lust is helping him with romance. Pride is helping him with confidence. It's a nice hook, but if we end there, then we're like, what's the actual journey here? What is the goalpost? Um, I don't quite understand what he has to do before we understand, oh, he has what um gotten back on his feet or he has improved his life in some way movies often have this sometimes we have to be a little arbitrary and be like it's about a battle of the bands or how about the movie let's look at the movie little miss sunshine you guys seen this um i hope so because i think it won an oscar in 2004 didn't it uh or uh was at least at least nominated for one um but this is the dramedy that is about who's seen it I uh, love that movie. Yeah, yeah you love it. fantastic. Okay. So let's talk about goalposts. What's the movie uh, about? <laughs> it's about a, it's sort of, it's an ensemble about a family, right? Yeah, a fam, uh, a um, dysfunctional family pulling together to uh, help whatever the daughter uh, make it across, make it to her, whatever, compete in a, in a, in a, Beauty pageant? Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, we have... You could look at the story of the the ensemble interactions with the family as being sort of the meat of the movie, right? The, the beauty pageant only happens at the end. But it does provide us with a sense of progress and a, and a destination. That's what road trip stories are kind of, like, really good at. It's like, oh, well, we want to we wanna mostly do a movie about these people trying to fix their relationship in whatever way. But we have that thing that they're heading towards that gives us a sense of, like, how close are we to that final goal? Even if it's a little bit arbitrary and it has this sort of, you know, battle of the bands kind of feel like, you know, a lot of teen movies will do this thing where it's like, well, we have a battle of the bands that we're all working, has all been leading up to, to give us a sense of progress and like completion. Um, and uh, even something like Napoleon Dynamite. Um, you guys have seen this, I hope as well. That's a movie that otherwise would be a little bit wandering and aimless and kind of um, just characters mumbling and bumbling around and bouncing off each other. But what are we working up to? What is the crux of the tangible goalpost in Napoleon Dynamite? The talent show. The talent show, yeah, and also the election. The um, mm -hmm. the Pedro, Pedro trying to win, what is it, class president or something? Um, and those things are actually tied together, aren't they? Because at the end, by competing in the talent show, wearing his vote for Pedro's shirt, Napoleon is helping boost Pedro's exposure. And ultimately, I think it helps him win the election as well, doesn't it? Um, yeah, it's been a while since I saw that one. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Pedro um, wins. Yeah, I think so. And I, I saw another movie that were it, it, recently, uh, The Two Popes. Fantastic, um, you know, uh, but what's, you know, it's more of a character study story, but there is a clear goal. Um, uh, Jonathan Price's character, you know, Pope Francis, before he became Pope, is trying to convince Anthony Hopkins, who plays Pope Benedict, to um, give him permission to retire. So that kind of like is the scaffolding for the whole story. But it's really about these two amazing actors, like kind of, you know, going at it and developing this interesting relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, it's hanging from the structure of like, okay, I need him to, I need to retire. You know, I need to get permission to retire. Right, so he has something that he wants from the other guy, and it's just it would just be one sentence that he requires him to say, but he needs to convince him to do it. He has to sign. He has to get him to sign a, you know, permission. Oh, he has to get him to sign. It, it, it's, it, it's almost like a parent, you know, getting your parent to sign permission to go on a trip or something. Yeah, I didn't know. You, you know, he keeps trying to. <laughs> yeah, that's you know one of the hazards of being a cardinal. You can't stop being a cardinal unless somebody make, lets you. 
Um, that's exactly. Fine. So yeah, you can see how that would otherwise just be a story of people hanging out in rooms, basically. Um, but by having that central goal and having like a trajectory, it gives us a sense of progress. It gives us something to actually be working towards, and like it helps us just understand the story so much better, and it just feels more satisfying. Um, fan fictionary says, "Can you be subtle when writing the hook, or does it mandatorily have to be obvious? It has to be obvious. If we're not sure what the hook is by the end of hearing the long line or the pitch, then you are dead in the water. Um, you're generally not trying to sneak things past, or you're not trying to make things too subtle in pitches. Like you, and you don't have to worry about spoilers or things like that. You kind of have to just lay all your cards on the table." Remember, you're pitching to, in the industry, you're pitching to people who hear a bunch of these every day. You need to get their attention and keep it and maintain it. And, like, again, it's a lot to ask of someone to give you that attention. So you got to reward them by giving them something that's worth paying attention to. And that might mean you have to put your good stuff at the forefront. If you don't have good enough stuff that you, need to, that you can put it at the forefront, then you just need better material. Um, okay, other common issues. Uh, anything else? Execution dependent. So it might be pretty much all there, but just sort of seem to rely on style, performances, or cinematography, or directing, or some other factors that are just difficult to express in your pitch. Something like Kill Bill, or John Wick, or Lord of the Rings. Some of these, I mean, Lord of the Rings is so elemental, it's almost like the Bible, and you typically shouldn't really be comping that anyway. Um, but I would say if you were going to write something like John Wick, then you got to be really careful with how you're going to specify what the hook of this is. So if you were to pitch John Wick now, and I think it was pitched differently but because it changed a lot from initial draft to later drafts, but you probably want to focus on this unique kind of underground world of assassins that exist amongst all the population and like have their own sort of um, you know society and currency. And like that's all the kind of stuff that makes John Wick set apart from other kind of just assassin you know movies where... A guy comes out of retirement because someone murdered his kid or whatever, and now he has to go get all the bad guys. So look for what sets that world apart. Just be careful with something that sounds like it would rely entirely on the style or the, or the directing. Um, so here's a question from Fan Fictionary. He says, do you need a logline per show, per season, or per episode? Um, so you ultimately need a pilot for the, a logline for the pilot, and you need a logline for the series too, but for the purposes of this course, I'm just going to look at pilot loglines. So don't worry about what happens in later seasons or later episodes. Just focus entirely on the pilot. That's the most important thing, and no one will read beyond that. Um, okay, so let's uh, look at some more tips before we go in. And let's. Um, I found this on the Pitch a Movie subreddit today. So let's maybe look at you, keeping all the tips that I have gone over in mind, like, you know, remember, motivation, stakes, and urgency, walls, boundaries, ticking clock, don't include things that aren't essential, specificity. Um, let's diagnose this one from the Pitch a Movie subreddit, and uh, I don't think this is anyone here, so feel free to say whatever you want about this. Um, but uh, this is called a Homeward Hound. It's a horror comedy. Here's the pitch as described by the writer. So this is about a dog that gets bitten by a zombie. After turning, it looks for its owner to find him missing. The owner goes on a traditional zombie movie survival adventure, but instead of following him, the movie only cuts to him occasionally and instead follows the zom dog's adventure to find his master. At the end of the movie, the owner gets to safety and has the traditional, yay, we survived ending, but then his dog shows up and he's like, no way, my dog found me. Then his dog lovingly bites him. The end. So actually kind of nice job getting through the whole story in just a paragraph. I mean, uh, so props to them for that. But let's look at what are some of the issues with this. What do you guys think? Feel free to weigh in in the chat or on voice. There are some big red flags in this one that we'll want to make sure to identify. I'll leave it up for a moment if you guys need to reread it, but feel free to weigh in. I will call on someone in about 10 seconds. Erickson, do you want to take this one? I missed like half the log line. Let me just reread it again. Um, 
Well, okay, so I think the thing that sort of jumped into my mind was that it mentions that, oh, it, it's only cutting away to, to the owner for, like, little snippets of the movie. So then what's happening with the dog? Right. It's... Any, you want to expand on that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, if it's a feature film, then what the hell are we watching for the, for the <laughs> yeah. majority of the film? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> that, is, that is the biggest red flag. You have, you have identified the major one, which is, what are we actually watching? Um, and, like, yeah. you wouldn't expect that question to come up as much, because, like, I, I guess the problem is sometimes the writer can really clearly see it in their head. And you run the, the table reads as well, and other events in the service. So maybe, have you seen this problem before where the writer's like, oh, well, I saw all those things, so I, I thought it would be clear in the pitch like what we'd be watching even but then they get to the end of it and you're like wait no but what is the movie right i think i think a lot of writers have that kind of thing built in because they have everything in their head right but it's like no we have to be able to see you on screen what is happening and you have to be able to explain to us what is happening from scene to scene not just say oh this character's goal is to uh get the love of his father back or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. So this is this is sort of more like describing a gimmick for a movie than it is describing the story itself. Um, it's like describing the beginning and the ending, but it, it, the middle is where you really need to be focusing. And it, in fact, you don't even need to go all the way through to the end. You can if you if you are able to or if you want to. Um, if it fits within your time and you're able to get all the way to the end, that's great. But generally, but like remember, you don't have to. You can be pitching something you haven't written yet, so you don't need to even know the ending. You're just pitching the idea of the movie, which means you can bring it up to like the midpoint and say, "This is the kind of thing that we're going to be doing until the end." So now he has to do blank before or else blank. Um, anyone else went away in on this? Homeward Hound. I just, I just love the last line. It's like then his dog shows up and he's like, "Oh no way, my dog found me." Yeah, it's kind of a, fu it's a funny gimmick. <laughs> but it's <laughs> and his dog lovingly bites him. Right. The end. It's, it's kind of just the gimmick is is the thing, though. Willow says the language feels passive as well. Um, at some points it might. Let me double check. Uh, dog gets bitten by a zombie after turning. Looks for its owner. The dog the owner gets the safety, and then the dog shows up. I mean, there might be a little bit of that. I wouldn't say that's like an overriding problem throughout just because we're saying... I, I do understand that he's saying the dog goes on this journey. It's not waiting for things to happen to it. I mean, at the beginning, him getting bitten is, you know, a coincidence or it might be just happenstance, which, but at the, the catalyst of the movie kind of can be. But yeah, generally, you want to keep it as active as possible in the descriptions. So that's a good thing to keep in mind for these pitches. Like, try to make it seem like, the, the remember, that your protagonist is in the driver's seat of the story, not the passenger seat. So they are the one that is making choices, that is moving the story forward. It's not like stuff is just occurring to them. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, honestly, I think this could actually be an interesting story, but it just, it's not really conveyed in this, like what the actual story is, right? Like, yeah, there's a dog going on an adventure. Okay, but what's the adventure? What's like the obstacles? And, you know, but it could be really interesting. Yeah, I, I, I was rereading it. Oh, sorry. I was, um, I was rereading it. And then the zombies, dumb dogs adventure to find his master. Does that mean he's interacting with other zombies interacting with other dogs in the neighborhood maybe he's coming across you know uh wolves that want to eat him or, or you know things like that but yeah you're right there's like no clear goal from the dog's perspective other than yeah finding the master right so the problem is that we are now having to do the work of coming up with what the movie is which that's that's the problem if we are now like oh well i guess it could be cool if there was if he had to team up with a cat and, like, that's what Homeward Bound is, isn't it? Different animals have to team up. So let's say he has to team up with a, a squad of other animals, and it's basically a zombie movie, but with animals. Like, one of them is bitten and is turning, and the animals are trying to understand what the infection is, and they can all talk to each other. It's like, uh, what's it called? Beasts of Burden, that comic, um, the little bit. Zombie dog teams up with werewolf cat. Sure, Nacho. Yeah, exactly. So, But we, now the fact that we are having to do the work for the writer means that the writer hasn't done the work. So it might just be that you haven't put enough effort into breaking down what happens in the story. This is the kind of thing where it's like my grandma will tell me, I got an idea for a movie at a family gathering and she'll t list like the beginning of something. And I'll be like, then what happens? Then she'll be like, well, that's your job. I don't know. I just have a couple of the ideas. I'm like, grandma, <laughs> I don't think this is Hollywood ready. Um, so yeah, we should not be the ones that have to come up with interesting ideas. We should be able to allow that idea to bloom in our minds and like see potential interesting things that can happen. But we should have enough examples of the interesting stuff that's going to happen that we like shouldn't have to rely entirely on that. We shouldn't have to brainstorm for you, basically. 
Um, Fanfictionary asks, is it better to pitch an anime series, a 3D series, or a live action series? Um, live action series out of all of those. Or, um, like, uh, you can pitch an animated series in pretty much the exact same way that you would pitch a live action series, but it might help if you have, like, art or something like that to go along with it, or if you have a, a short, a series of YouTube cartoons or something that you can, like, say, it's going to be more of these. Something like that. Um, in general, you can't really pitch anime series. Um in the U.S., at least, um, there are certain things like I don't know. Netflix is moving more into the international anime type market and might, at certain points, be staffing writers on that. But it's not like like no one's really taking pitches for anime series. A 3D series, I uh, would that would just sort of fall under animation. But there's not a lot of 3D series on TV, um, so you typically want to just pick between live action or just say animated. It's not really up to you ultimately if you just want to create this like. If, if, if you're creating the show and you're not going to be a significant artistic force on it, those artistic decisions are not really going to be up to you, so you can just have in mind whether it's going to be live action or animated, but generally don't pitch anime. Yeah. Um, okay, anyone else want to weigh in on the zombie dog idea? Last of Us made Homeward Bound, says Merrickson. Yeah, exactly. Those would be the comps, um, probably, and... Uh, you know, if, if this writer fleshed this out more and, like, reworked this, if they were in this class, then they might be able to f take this to an interesting place. Anyone else? Okay, so we've got a couple more things to look at here um, before we go into this, but be working on, if you have your own just kind of scattered ideas, start to put those together into something kind of like this, you know, like it can be just one paragraph like this, it can be up to 90 seconds or two minutes, and if you just have like an attempt at pitching something, you can also just, it doesn't have to be refined, it doesn't have to be good, you can kind of just tell us whatever you've got, and I can start, of, start to help you guide it into place before next week. Um, so yeah, Homeward Hound, this is my take on it. This is more a long joke than a description of plot events. There's not really specificity in character here. It's hard to see the movie, and by see the movie, I mean this is a term that, that we use to refer to the fact that we can't really imagine the kind of stuff that would happen in this. Because the words in the pitch are used in service of describing the gimmick rather than delivering on the promise of a unique premise and a strong second act. If you ever find yourself saying that a character goes on pretty much the predictable plot path for the genre, then something's probably really wrong with your pitch, unless it absolutely subverts or blows those cliches out of the water in some kind of intriguing way. Yeah, very rarely will you want to use the words in your pitch to say, yeah, and you know what happens next, basically. You've seen these before. Like, uh, you got to tell us what happens, and it's got to be unique and interesting and deserve our attention and time. Here's a pretty good example I saw from Pitch a Movie. Um, desperate for a sure hit, a fledgling producer decides to make remake a classic blockbuster. As the budget rises and the pressure mounts, he comes to believe the only way to remake this classic properly is with the original cast and surviving crew, no matter how old or crazy or infirm they have become. Um, so it's a few too many words here, and like we probably want to avoid things like he comes to believe that the like he comes to believe something. Um, you typically just want to say what characters do. You don't have to give us a catalyst for a catalyst by saying he comes to believe that the right course of action is this. You can just say that he does the thing. Um, so yeah, a few too many words here. There's a clear hook and motive and journey. Um, decides to and comes to believe would be the red flags there that imply the lack of urgency. Avoid saying that your character must come to terms with, navigate, or understand anything. That is all red flags for intangible goalposts and indefinite and vague journeys. We need to not suggest internal and novelistic stories, because remember, movies are about people doing stuff. Um, but if I got this, I would still ask the writer to proceed into the pitch and expand on this right away. I wouldn't have any clarifying questions for this off the bat. Um, so this one's pretty good. All right, um, let's do this uh, new thing. I'm going to pitch a movie. Um, and this is an idea I have. I'm probably not ever going to write, but I just think it's funny and cool. Maybe one day I'll write this. I don't really know. Uh, Nacho, I'm going to recruit you to listen to my pitch and respond to it. Are you ready? Oh, maybe he's not. Nacho, are you there? Oh, maybe we lost him. Uh, I will. Let's get Merrickson then. Oh, so I'm playing producer. Okay, yeah, go I'm ahead. Yeah, I'm producer now of MGM. Uh, and we're going to branch out from the Bond franchise with some big sci-fi action. So uh, here's um, here's my pitch for this one. So this is uh, my current title for this is Small Arms Fire. I don't love the title, um, but I just don't have anything better at the moment. And I've only put this together right before class. So let's see how I do. Um, this is a sci-fi action movie with heavy horror elements. That's like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids meets Doom. 
All right, ready for the, uh, any clarifying questions based on that? Um, no, I, I have a vague idea of, of Doom, but yeah, go ahead. Sure, we can also say mm, Starship Troopers, perhaps, if that is a little bit easier of a comp. Um, so here's the idea. Here's the kind of the vague logline. So raiding the home of a mad scientist, an insectophobic special forces squad leader and his team are caught and shrunken to the size of mice. Now the sergeant must lead his friends in furious combat through the walls, vents, and across the countertops to find a way to reverse their condition, battling their way past has household hazards and the villain's collection of vicious bugs. So I'll wait for clarifying so, questions, then move into the pitch. Go ahead. The, the thing that sort of hung me up briefly was the insectophobic, because most people are sort of have a dislike for insects. But yeah, I guess I guess... Yeah, I think it's an interesting logline go on with the pitch, I guess. Sure. Um, I would agree that most people dislike bugs, but I think most people dislike spiders as well. And, like, uh, describing someone as arachnophobic still is a relatively specific thing. Um, so I guess you're right. Maybe there's a better way to phrase that in some way, like a crippling fear of insects. Maybe there's a more specific term than just insectophobic. Apparently the scientific term is, like, entophobic or something like that, but I didn't think people would know what that was. Um, so let, uh, does that answer that? Well, never, never mind. But let me let me go into the actual pitch if you just want me to proceed. Um, so uh, so here, let me put, bring up my stopwatch and see how long this takes because I'm going to be doing this for the first time. <laughs> you should all not be doing this for the first time and should, in fact, be practicing these beforehand. All right, let's see how I do. So um, in this world, there's a terrorist mad scientist that in the opening sequence we see does this massive terrorist attack where he... Uh, makes giant bugs and makes them rampage through the streets of a major city like, let's say, Paris. And this kills some of our main character's uh, family members in this strike, and he barely survives the attack himself, giving him this lifelong fear of insects. Um, this terrorist becomes, like, in the in our, you know, first act or so, we understand that he has become the most wanted man in the entire world, and the special forces leader makes him his lifelong nemesis to track him down and bring him to justice. So they finally track him down to his suburban house, just like a regular average suburban house. And then he, once they breach inside, he and his team are caught and shrunken down to little tiny, like, army men size. And now this um, terrorist has them sort of in his clutches, and he, his goal is to use them for experiments, putting them through little lab rat mazes and weird little doll houses and pick, sticking them with pins and stuff like that. Um, so they escape into the walls, and now they have to battle through just household hazards. So imagine a woodpecker pecks through the wall and starts eating them, or uh, there might be a spider web that they have to navigate across. Um, they have to avoid the vacuum cleaner and avoid the villain capturing them and sticking them with pins to his boards and stuff. On their way to reversing this condition, bringing the bad guy to justice and taking him down. So our main character is sort of forced to overcome his fear of, you know, his crippling fear of insects that he got years ago, defeat his ultimate nemesis, and ultimately become normal size again. All right, that was 92 seconds. So, questions? Are you asking for everyone or just... Oh, no, just you. Me? Oh, okay. Um, I feel like you kind of like info dumped towards the beginning because there was a lot of stuff you shared regarding the terrorist guy um i think what, what caught me is the the i guess the the fun and games aspect of you know navigating or sorry navigating is a bad word um you know dealing with being shrunken and um trying to get off uh bugs and things like that to get to the guy but I think did you actually sh did you actually share like how they're gonna go back to normal size? I no, no, that. I'm not quite sure. I guess oh, they just goodness. have to find the shrink ray again. I'm not not, not totally sure. On that <laughs> yeah, yet. the reverse shrink ray, right? Yeah. Because I think I think it's like they're essentially at his mercy, right? So how would they be able to go back? So the idea is, um, my thought was that they he catches them and shrinks them down, but they escape and then are trying to basically they're like behind enemy lines so to speak and he's trying to recapture right. them so in order to do so he's an entomologist and a bug specialist so he's got like you know his big jar full of spiders that he's like this is a yeah, yeah, yeah. and he lets it out through the walls of the house and now they have to avoid these big spiders for a whole sequence and they've got like you know right. stacks of ammo it's like a shoot 'em up starship troopers type action movie set yeah, in yeah. a suburban house yeah 
Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. I mean, I really loved Honey, I Shrink the Kids. As kid. And I think the concept of that is really cool because it turns it into like an action survival thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it takes, you know, it takes concepts of Resident Evil with these giant bugs and you have to fight them off and kill them and all that stuff. It's just, I think, structurally, I'm kind of missing... It seems like they have so much against them, and I guess that's for the writer to, for you to, sort of write out and figure out how to um, how to fix up the end. How to I think fix such a, what's um, the question? Huh? What, sorry, what's the question, or what's the thing that uh, you're you're saying? There's too they have too many obstacles in their way. Yeah, it's it seems like it. I don't know. I don't know. Um, because it does feel like they're at his, uh, they're at his mercy, and I guess that's a good thing because it has the audience guessing, right? Well, so the the idea was while they're caught at the beginning, they very quickly escape. So therefore, right. they are not at his mercy except at the like you know the end of the first act. They're trying to avoid being caught by him. They're like sort of running rampant through his house, trying to find a way to. Oh, oh no, no. Um, what I meant by at his mercy is in the in terms of. You have no way of getting back to regular stuff without his help, oh, right? Um, no, I'm not. I'm not sure. I guess that's a good question, though. I mean, yeah, I could see how, like, in a pitch like this, you'd probably want to say like the specific thing they have to do. Um, I, yeah. right, I just had not worked that one out yet, so totally valid. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. But, but yeah, it's, I think it's an interesting concept to to take the concept of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and turn it into an action survival A gory, thing. yeah, like survival horror. Right, right where the insects in that movie were, were like all friendly and I remember there's like an ant they make friends with. Yeah, but how um, terrifying could that be? Yeah, exactly. If you're a little but guy, to make it where it's like birds and stuff like picking them off, and that's a cool one. I also think Intriguing. Yeah, we could we, uh, do some uh, rip, some some if we just take, because like the, the little adventure genre I think has we've seen some various versions of that and everything from the Army Men video games. If you remember those, um, oh yeah, 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 those were, kind of, those were cool. Yeah. Those were cool because like you yeah. were just you had to like you turn regular everyday environments into like whole battlefields basically. Right. Um, Literally, yeah. And uh, but they're usually all pretty. You're right; they're pretty friendly. They're like um, they're kind of whimsical for the most part. So sort of reimagining those as horrific as possible, I thought would be a right. fun basis for a movie like this, where you yeah. we're looking at this with the tone of something like Doom or Starship Troopers, but we're doing silly stuff. Like you have a mm -hmm. you know your character by the end, we're gonna have their main character like riding on the back of a giant spider. He's got armor made out of like a thimble and like a little. What would he wear for his uh? chest plate he'd wear like a little um lego like a walnut, a walnut shell, or shell that's so cute i love that um but yeah exactly he's taking a matchbook and he's rowing it down a river while fish are trying to eat him right. like you could do so many little fun set pieces obviously this would be a hugely expensive movie that nobody i don't think anybody would ever make this unless you know kevin hart and the rock were in it um but uh <laughs> yeah i mean this that's why i'm probably never gonna write this is because it's just gonna like that's just so much cgi it's so expensive but anyway Thank you for um, responding to the pitch. Um, some good questions there. And yeah, Merrickson is right. You typically want to know exactly what the character is trying to do. Or like you just say, if you're trying to find a way to do something, usually not the best. So my bad on that one. You want to have like a clear thing that they're that they're heading towards or like the mechanism by which they will succeed. It needs to be as tangible as you can make it. So yeah, for sure. Right. <clears throat> um, okay, so uh, that's how you kind of want to do this. So notice that I just did that in 90 seconds. So you can pitch pretty much any story in amount around that amount of time um and uh you you don't need to go through all the way to the ending but you should give us the sense of the trajectory of where we're going uh okay so um let's see what you'll need for pitching what exactly what i just did so you need genre you'll need a sentence or two that's pretty reductive um if you can it's about a blank who does blank it has to blank so standard pitch is imagine you saying like sort of the character and like backstory or their normal life for the first you know 10 pages or so the catalyst is the thing that is going to set the story in motion so um the uh the the event that is the sort of first domino falling that's going to knock all the others over in mind the catalyst was they track down the house of this international terrorist scientist and they break in they breach the doors um so the break two is going to be what moves us from the first act into the second act and that's going to be remember your um script camp students are very familiar with act breaks by now but the act break is going to be the uh, a choice or decision on the behalf of your main character that sort of allows us to 
engage with the premise and um, take like have all the fun and games that are presented by the genre that you've given us. Um, so the second act break in the story that I just suggested was the main character like uh, resolves to set off through the wall like they've escaped from the clutches of the villain and now they're going to um, go on this dangerous journey through the walls of the house to find a way up to the shrink ray or whatever so they can get to be normal size again and just imply the trajectory of the kind of stuff that we're going to be doing. Like, I just listed off a couple of the, like, sorts of thrills that we would see. You don't have to do the brainstorming for me, but it just gives you, like, oh, here's a couple things that might be the sort of thing that we would do in this story that gives us, like, the general progression towards the end. So, um, the full story pitch would include the ending as well. That would be, like, up to two or three minutes. Um, you often like to sort of bookend this to showcase the character change. Like, at the end of this, I was like, he therefore overcomes his fear of insects by going through this journey and also defeating the villain, thus intertwining the internal journey with the external one. I just kind of picked Fear of Insects because I was like, I don't know. <laughs> He's fighting a bunch of giant bugs. How do we make a particularly uphill, difficult, or ironic journey for that character? He's a guy who hates bugs. It's as easy as that sometimes. Um, so look at this little diagram here. Once upon a time, there was blank, every day blank, one day blank because of that blank until finally blank. That's one of the Pixar kind of storytelling principles. Um, and that is to say that uh, you can kind of, it's almost like fairy tale ish the way you can approach storytelling sometimes. It just If you're going for just the basics, then we need to say act one is every day there was blank. Every day blank is like leading up to the catalyst. One day, that's the catalyst. Because of that, act two, until finally trajectory into act three and, and finale. Okay, um, so if we have anything that you guys are ready to pitch or at least go over the basics of to help you clarify and um, uh, start to get your ducks in a row before next week. Then you can post any of these things that you have um, and we can help you fill them out. Or if you have a pitch that you want to just try. I mean, I just pitched that for the very first time. Um, if you have one that you want to just riff as well, you can feel free to do the same. It does not have to be perfect. What have you guys got? bring up the chats Oop. so feel free to weigh in on text or via voice or comment if you are on our twitch or youtube streams or something like that We have about 10 people in the Discord at the moment. Does someone have something to share? It can be very vague. It can be just an overview. It can be the type of thing you want to do. Anything at all, whatever you've got. So I'm doing something very risky at the moment. Okay. What is it? It's it's kind of unique. You've, you've heard it before. It's uh, Helen Unbound. That's the current title of it. It's kind of like Captain Marvel meets Clash of the Titans a little bit. Okay, great. That's an interesting set of comps. Um, do you want to go yeah, into it? It's, it's the best I could do for this extremely... It's, it's, it's a wild story, and it's basically the most powerful... She's she's the most powerful demigod in the world, but she, Helen's the most powerful demigod in the world, but she can't do social things. She's not good with people. Okay, great. And so she is this a movie, or is this a TV? This is a pilot, right? This is, a, this is, a, this is the pilot, okay. and I'm just kind of winging it from here. Because, uh, yeah, I've... That's fine. Yeah, you can wing it. I just winged it in front of the whole world. Yeah. Go for it. The most powerful demigod in the world, and and she's going to go on this... In the first season, which is the only season I'm promising you guys... And... No, just a pilot. No whole season. Yeah. So, in the pilot... Right. These people... The, these men from Mycenae come, come by... And and beg the king for help, but the king refuses. So Helen sneaks off to join them, and they have 
and, and then there's the adventure. And then, but but they're, they're, they're being assailed by bandits at that point. So, yeah, they're, the bandits are the conflict in the pilot. Okay, great. And so, yeah. you're sent, and so, like, remember, focus on the character here. So, um, she's trying to do, what's the goal of this episode? The goal of this episode is kind of to get these guys to... The goal of this episode is that they're trying to find someone who can who can kind of help their cause achieve a greater pro- level of prominence and ability to do what they want to do, which is to, to retake the city of Mycenae. Okay, so just, is, just a, thing, a thing to watch out for, though, is if, you, if it takes significantly more words to answer a question than it takes yeah, to ask it, it might be that it's, the answer is too diffuse. Um, so we could take, like, what's the dog in the zombie story trying to do? He's trying to find his master. Right? Find his master, yeah. And it's like, he's trying to go, they're, they're trying to go to Mycenae because that's, well, that that would be a d- d- distraction, but I don't know. So instead of saying they are trying to do things, remember, focus on the main character and what is the main so, character trying to do. So is she trying to get yeah. home? Han's not trying to get home. She's trying to get away from home. Trying to get away from home. Okay. Trying to see the world, kind of. And, and starting with Mycenae. Okay, so I guess just... I think this is something we may have discussed a little bit before. That and her plans go slightly awry when... And are pretty much... Yeah, her plans go awry. She gets figured out... Later on in the season, but yeah, that's later. Okay, so the things to be looking at for this one are that sense of motivation and urgency. I understand your main character has escaped from captivity and is now maybe looking for a goal. Is that what you're sort of saying? Is that is she's the... looking? She's kind of looking for a goal. Yeah, I see. she's looking for a goal and something, something worthy of her her time and attention. And these people from my senior are kind of the answer. Okay, um, so I think that right opportunity to leave. Right. Okay. Right. So, is it that they rescue her only if she will help them, or they, you're saying they don't even know who she is at first? They don't even know who she is. Okay. They don't really, and they, and some of them think that she's a goddess initially. Oh. So they Others are not okay. easily fooled. So they they know that she's powerful, and they know that she can do things, but yeah, they haven't seen all of what she can do. So you might a uh, comp for this might be something like Tangled, um, which has a similar. I like Tangled too, yeah. It's, 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 Tangled might be better than Captain Marvel. I think so, yeah. Um, so if, but remember that in Tangled, she does have a strong goal that is. It's not just figure out what I want to do and pick something. Um, she's trying to get back to the castle that or the the kingdom that she was king, kidnapped from, basically as a kid that every year she's been dreaming of and she like mm-hmm. watches the lanterns rise from the battlements at, during her birthday every year doesn't she and like she has this really strong desire and goal that makes us invest more in her quest it's although you it does work a little better for a tv show for a character yeah, to be I, like i don't know what i want to do i guess i'll pick this like you still think, yeah it helps it has to have to... something more specific that they they have been, they want something that is more kind of concrete maybe she wants to see the lion get the lion gate of mycenae but just because to... it's on her it was in a book somewhere and she read the book and she liked the book and she cherished the book or the scroll technically because yeah okay maybe that that could be the way to sort of take it i mean the just seeing something yeah. is a little bit of a it's not the just... strongest motivation remember that rapunzel wants to go live back in the kingdom that she was kidnapped from and be among the people there and and like uh have her yeah, whole life back oh and yeah so she wants to be among the people without them revering her or treating her as a goddess or something okay. or yeah yeah right okay i get it so a little also a little like ariel from little mermaid she wants to just be a normal person basically she doesn't want to live in seclusion anymore and that is a relatable and understandable goal I know, but, yeah she doesn't she doesn't want she 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 wants it's complicated she's different than ariel because she doesn't she wants to be a normal person but she also loves the gifts she's been given right 
Okay. Well, I think Ariel so likes that... being a mermaid, doesn't she? I guess maybe she doesn't. <laughs> maybe she doesn't. Yeah, who knows? I think... Second movie? Yeah, second maybe. Movie. Oh, I didn't know there was a second movie. Um, there there was. It was... It was uh... <laughs> Yeah, the Disney straight to DVD sequels are usually not going to be the best, but um, so yeah, just it was, it, was, it was okay for the for the idea of it, but it was, failed in the execution. I see. Yes, very common. So um, yeah. no Disney. Right. Anyway. Yes, Disney, always doing that. But um, so yeah, for things to focus on for this one, remember just like if you can make the main character's goal more specific and make us want to see her succeed more. You're always going to have more yeah. investment from the reader. Um, I think that, yeah, figuring her out and why she wants to uh, do things differently than everyone else. Right. But, so, yeah, simpler is better. The fewer words that it will take to explain the reason why she wants to do this, the better sign it is that it makes sense, right? Like, why does Rapunzel want to get to the kingdom? She wants to go home. Um, why does Frodo want to throw the ring into the volcano to save the world? Like if it should just be a save the world words. would also save the world would also help describe part of the reason why I think Helen would. That's the reason the brothers are fighting to save their world. In Lord of the Rings or in your your story? You mean my the, story? Oh, in yours. Yeah. Okay, so to save the world, you didn't mention that in the pitch. I should have mentioned that because <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, it you doesn't relate to Helen. It's related to Agamemnon and Menelaus, who are two two kind of. Yeah, and then there's Odysseus and Penelope and a bunch of other characters who kind of show up along the way. Even Odin appears. Okay, yeah, you can... And Brunhilda. So, you can definitely mention the sorts of stuff that will happen in the yeah. pilot. Um, you don't have to get too Brunhilda, specific. Brunhilda is probably going to be there. Okay, just remember, don't get I too distracted by these things. We want to make sure yeah, we're focusing I've on the loved. crux of the A story and then suggesting, oh, these are the types of games we will play. On the way to yeah, and there, there's gonna be like, there's gonna be like an episode if I get the full series, no, which I not doubt. Get the full series, <laughs> pilot only, only pilots. We're only focusing on pilots for the pitching course. Like we, if, okay. if, if we're leaning on material that's outside of the scope of the pilot, it's gonna be that's just stuff that will never exist. That's stuff that will never exist. Yeah, you know? right. it'll be sad. It will be. It's a sad, sad world that oh. not every TV show can be made, but. Like, you know, I'm not saying that you can never, ever pitch the pilot to anyone and potentially have a series be made, but remember how much intense development goes into a show after the pilot is turned in. I remember. And it's not going to be all up to you where it kind of goes. So, like, even in the best case scenario, your plans for the whole season or multiple seasons will be out the window. That's if your pilot gets bought. So, like, uh, why just put your effort into writing and finishing the pilot. Yeah, beyond season one probably is too much. Yes, I would agree. Beyond the pilot, in fact, would be too much. But you can have a general idea of what happens. Yeah, but yeah, it's, you need to know yeah, he's going to be kind of like setting up theoretically. So you can have like some idea, but just don't put too much work into it. Oh, uh, I've also got on an unrelated note, I've got a pitch for Runaways. If I ever get the rights to that. Which is never <laughs> right. Okay, so we'll let's, let's pause for right now and let's see if anyone else has pitches that they want to do. And if we have more time, we have half an hour left in class. So if no one else has one, then we can hear another one. Thanks, Micah. Um, all right, let's move on to You're someone welcome. else. Thank you very much. Um, who else has a pitch that they want to at least get some basic stuff down for? Just give us whatever you've got, and I can kind of tell you what you should maybe work on in preparation for next week. Is it, is it okay if it's, like, really off the cuff and just, like, a rough idea? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I write exclusively exclusively features. I kind of shy away from the idea of TV series. And stuff Me like too. That, but I've been... Oh, okay, that's cool. Um, I've been kind of playing around with this idea of, like, a sitcom where it takes place, like, at a two, between two mall kiosks. Because, you know, those guys just hang out all day. Not many people really go to them. They go to the department stores and yeah, things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, they sell, like, perfume and stuff. Yeah, they sell perfume, like, you know, cheap sunglasses, uh, you know, trinkets and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I just had this idea of, like, what would a show look like that if, like, 
these guys just hang out all day in front of their kiosks and I mean, it would make like for like a, a, an SNL skit, right? But then, how could you expand that into? Well, I think you'll need a conflict, um, or like some sense of what the conflict could, types of conflicts that you'd even have. Um, right. And if we look at a show like, uh, it can even be as simple as like The Office, right? The Office is a show about people who work at a paper company, but the boss yeah, is yeah. super overbearing and awkward and is always causing embarrassing situations around him, and everyone's always having to cover for him. So, like, that's the kind of conflicts that we get into, stuff that's basically started by Michael, right? So right. I think you might need a generator of conflict to act as a story engine for the show. So it might be a person. It might be a competition. Right. Is it, like, are they competitive with each other? They're always trying to, like, take each other's kiosk down. Um, yeah, are, I, I are feel they like friends? The, well, Go ahead. I, I would say like they're they're more like friends because you know they they work next to each other, their kiosks are beside each other. I thought maybe like the conflict would come from like mall management where they're always under threat of being like shut down for I don't know I don't know like not meeting sales or something. <laughs> okay, so maybe the episodes will revolve around them doing crazy schemes to increase their sales. Yeah, or like dealing with like shoplifters and things like that. Yeah, I just know, I just think the idea of the mall environment was kind of interesting. Yeah, played that out as. Yeah, yeah there's, there's really something like there, there, especially nowadays when you know the the big box mall has been kind of deflating to some extent, given the prevalence of online shopping, right? So yeah, yeah, use that, that would be good. as like a you know a thematic backdrop for the show to say you know malls all over the country are shutting down. You need to get your sales up over this certain threshold, or we can't have you here anymore. We need to bring in someone who can bring in the money. Right, right. So there's something there it's that something makes it a little relevant. Kind of Yeah. Does that give that's, you some that's ideas all of, that. of uh, have, like, something? Big... Oh, that's that's fine if that's all you have. But does that give you some ideas of like maybe how to start focusing on the, an an engine that will be generating enough conflict that we can imagine, you know, like years of of stories based on this? Right. Interpersonal kinds of conflict. Okay. Yeah. Interpersonal conflicts are always good, and and be thinking also like what kind of external stuff are we going to be doing? Like, um, are they in a rivalry with the other sh shops in the mall? Is there an evil janitor? Oh, where, how, where, what show have we done an evil janitor on before? Um, is there, uh, you know, who are some of the antagonists going to be? Perhaps as well could be helpful. I think you said the mall owner or like the management of the mall. Um, yeah. Something like that. So be thinking of points of conflict. Um, we don't want to end up with just two guys hang out in a mall. We got to have them actually like doing interesting stuff. And getting into shenanigans yeah i get yeah, it shenanigans of whatever yeah. variety i mean there's different types of comedy shenanigans you have like paul blart on one hand you have like kind of you know arrested development on the other where it's like the, it can right. be as complicated or as broad as you need it to be um but we just need some sense of like the kinds of conflicts that we'll be seeing so we can start to imagine the sorts of funny situations that will result right thanks connor sure thank you any questions on that No questions. All right. Um, sounds good. Nacho says a big international, big national company might acquire the backward sleepy mall property. Yeah, maybe that could be. Uh, is there like a mom and pop mall? I guess there must be something like that. But then, yeah, like if a big company comes in and buys them up, all the rules are going to change. All a bunch of new arbitrary standards are going to be put into place, and the characters might be forced out of their sort of comfort zone of like we don't really have to work that much all day into like oh god we have to come up with like really we have to hit quotas and like. Get, we have to totally change how we do our business. Maybe something like that could be what motivates it. Okay. Um, thanks, Merrickson. So, um, other pitches or other fragments that I can tell, help you tell you what to work on or the direction to be taking it? You don't need to have very much. It can be just something that you think would be cool. You don't actually have to write the whole script after this. Okay, if nobody's got any more, I guess we can do one more for Micah, and then we might just have to call class early if nobody um, is going to be pitching. But at least hopefully you've gotten the tips that you need to start to like to, to know the road that you're supposed to go on or the, the steps that you'll need to take next in order to get your get an idea into working shape. Oh, Willa's got something. Go ahead, Willa. All right. I um, 
kind of just put this together on the fly. I already, I've already had a pitch uh, ready, but it hit a lot of bad things, so I just completely reworked it. We'll see okay. uh, how it goes. Uh, so uh, this is for uh, Pop and Jay, uh, Dandelion in the Garden, a uh, feature-length uh, animated film uh, drama. Um. <clears throat> In a world of anthropomorphic dragons, an accident leaves a rambunctious child wheelchair bound. She pursues her athletic dreams while grief and uh, tears her family apart. Right, okay. So um, I think I've given feedback on this one a couple times before, um, yes. just through different events um, over time. Um, the main thing with this one being, uh, I think that they're the, just the flavors that you're mixing here are not going to be ones that almost anyone's going to sort of understand um, just at, from the pitch itself or possibly even from, from reading the script just because this is one of those things where if something's never been done before and if we can't think of any comps that are even similar to the thing that you're doing, you have to ask yourself why. Like, why has no one done a story like that? Why doesn't that thing exist? Why aren't there a bunch of examples of that? So it might just be that you have to if, if the script itself is amazing, it might blow it, like, everyone's minds. And, like, that's what you have to kind of do at that point. You have to be able to say, I know that sounds strange, but trust me on this. It's mind-blowing, right? Um, so I think that there's there's a big hurdle there just in terms of what the script is about and the tone that you're describing. The, the tone is just, like, doesn't really exist, um, which is an animated whimsical characters in really intense dramatic story. That's... Um, I think before we've even tried to brainstorm some comps for this and you've come up with some things that are more like in the anime kind of world, is that kind of what this feels more like than a Western movie? Sort of. Yes. Okay. So, um, it, go ahead. Uh, all right. So disabilities are weeds in the garden of society. They're imperfections that people want to pluck out or fix. But the truth is that if you nourish them and help them to grow, they can create a beauty all their own and can benefit the garden. Okay, so that's like the theme of the movie? That is, that, yes, that's the theme. Okay, so well. um, theme can come up uh, a little bit in pitches typically we should sort of like be kind of implying what the theme might be it's good to have it in mind and, and obviously this is something you've, you've worked on for a while so clearly you've put a lot of work into into the theme and into figuring out like why you're telling this specific story um ultimately though a pitch has to get someone excited about reading the thing and in order to be excited about it they have to kind of be able to like see it or be like they have to kind of imagine a version of it that makes sense to them um, and I would say that the, the basics of your story are pretty much there. Like, I understand a kid who has been put into a wheelchair now is trying to be an athlete. And the goalpost, I think you have said before, is like a big, is there one big sort of competition or battle of the whatever um, sport that she's trying to work up to for the movie? Yes. There is. Okay. So that might be worth mentioning in the pitch, just so we know, like, beyond just pursuing an athletic goal, she's trying to win the Olympics or whatever, like get a gold medal at this thing, whatever it is, just to be to be as concrete as possible. Um, but uh, just like, mm, yeah, I, I guess the biggest thing in, in this one is that I struggle to understand the tone um, and that uh, I, I think that yeah, this is the kind of thing that you just have to kind of prove that it works. Um, you might have to make a, like a short cartoon of this yourself or you might want to consider writing a book beforehand or a comic or something like that. Um, if, if an idea is out there enough, sometimes you have to just do a little extra to be like, no, no, trust me, it, it's going to work. And if you really believe in it, then there's got to be some way to realize it besides just a feature script sometimes. So um, like, uh, just might be some, some things to think about if you're, if you're having people bounce off of this one a little bit just because it is so out of the box. Like, I couldn't even tell you what genre this is. What genre is this? Um, family drama. Okay, right. But 
I guess there's not really usually family dramas about dragons playing sports is the is the thing um and it just feels like clashing contrasting flavors uh it feels like kiwi on a pizza which like in some cultures and in some specific areas they might eat and might enjoy but if you were trying to sell kiwi on a pizza as the new menu item at papa john's you would have trouble doing that because that's just not something that people understand can work um so uh i would yeah my, my suggestions for you would be out, outside of just the pitch itself which in terms of the pitch maybe just give us a little better sense of the final goalpost like thing that we're working towards but if you can do some other version of this or you know write a short even a short story or some, something like that um you might just be in a little bit better position to pitch it in the first place any questions on this Oh, Merrickson has a comment. Perhaps go ahead, Merrickson. Well, the the thing about the disability thing, um, I feel like the closest comp that I can think of is maybe like if you think of how to train your dragon, how that ends, mm -hmm. right? So it has like a serious kind of thing where Hiccup, spoiler alert, Hiccup loses his foot mm -hmm. and he becomes like... Um, Oh my god, I forgot the dragon's name. Uh, toothless. Yeah. He becomes like, oh, yeah, he becomes like Toothless. Um, so I was wondering, is that the kind of tone that Willow is trying to evoke, where maybe there's still hope and there's all this? And yeah, Willow, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Have you seen How to Train Your Dragon? Oh, yeah, she thumbs up. Um, <laughs> um, so, I've actually seen it. <laughs> and I know, that, I know that How to Train Your Dragon doesn't really focus much on him like the struggles of him losing one foot but it's still like a perfect symbolism for the movie and i think maybe that's what god yeah like a spam on i got doing um i think i think it's still it still kind of evokes the symbolism of that and it's says a lot so maybe willow if you could tailor your script to sort of evoke not the same thing, but like go about it in a similar way where um, you don't focus too much on the disability because if you do, then it changes. I think it changes the tone drastically of this you know, un, uh, un movie where dragons are racing. And so that's just my thought. I don't know. You can feel free to respond below. What do you think? I get, I think, I, I, I get what you are saying, I think, but I feel like this is the reason why I am writing this. This is about how society views disabilities, not how a disabled uh, character views themselves. It, it makes it feel like a disability is a bad thing. And it is not. It is not a bad thing at all. And, like, having a disabled character is not a sad thing. It's not, it's not bad. It's just something that exists. And so the problem is not the disability. The problem and comes from the family the family and the family dynamics and the family relationships and how they are tearing themselves apart because of how they view disability. The main character, she's fine. She, she's adjusting and uh, she is inspired by Paralympic athletes. Um, and, and she's just ready to get out there and go fighting and others are trying to protect her. I, I, I didn't get to finish my pitch. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, maybe, maybe it will make it a little bit more clear. I don't know. But as I said, this is a bit off the cuff. I do understand it's an unusual story. I, I, I get that and it's not. All, all right. So I will try to finish. Go for it. Pop and Jay is a feisty girl who loves the thrills of competition. Right before she starts her first day of school, she is in an accident that leaves her paralyzed and wheelchair bound. Eager to have fun, she tests the limits of her new disability by training for an endurance race. Meanwhile, her mother gives up her career as a world-famous chef to become a caretaker. 
but the overprotectiveness becomes stifling to Popinjay and threatens to end both her athletic dreams and her spark for life. Her father, a military drill instructor, realizes that no matter how powerful he is, he can't protect his baby girl from the hardships of life. Behind his wife's back, he trains Popinjay, Popinjay to grow stronger both physically and mentally until all the mother's bad predictions come true. So, okay, thank you for that. Um, so what, what do you mean all the predictions come true? Um, the mother is, has become overprotective. She's worried about her daughter, her daughter's health. Um, she's worried about, uh, Popinjay discovering that she can't do anything. So therefore Popinjay becomes true, uh, becomes depressed and such. And Popinjay does end up hitting the limits of her, uh, capabilities. And she has to work through that. Um, Everything the mother has been warning about and has been overprotective about comes true, but it's not the horrific thing that the mother thinks it is. Okay. Um, cool. So thanks for that. And clearly, I mean, you've put a lot of work and, and time into the character relationships and fleshing every member of the ensemble out. Um, and so the, 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 I guess my comments just sort of still stand. At the end of this, I'm like, but they're dragons? You know what I mean? Like, this sounds like a story with people, and I struggle to understand why this is an animated film with dragons. Um, the audience for animated films with dragons would typically not see a, a movie about a grieving family. The audience for movies about grieving families would typically not see an animated movie about dragons. It's as simple as that. Um, so, like, uh, it's it's cool that, like, the, that the, the characters feel very real and dynamic and, like, realistic... But the fact that they are so realistic and that you are trying to make a certain statement about disability in society and stuff makes it stranger to me that it takes place in this alternate world and not our real world. It doesn't make it feel like... Uh, I just am wondering why, you know? Um, why not set this in the real world if you want to talk about the real world? Um, and I understand that there's always ways that sci-fi and fantasy can talk about the real world in sort of, you know, metaphorical ways. Um, but if specifically you're talking about, like... Uh, I don't know. I guess that... I hope that sums up the the my point of confusion there um but yeah i mean the the, the it, it sounds like though that the 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 dynamics and the characters are very well developed at the very least um Marikson says i think the trope of family falling apart is not one usually found in children's and family films um i guess i guess often there are broken families in in children and family films including in how to train your dragon but uh, I guess the focus of those movies is not usually watching the pain caused by that, like, or not like wallowing in the pain caused by, or explore, exploring too deeply the pain caused by those family conflicts or things like that. So, like, for instance, it'll be like, a parent is dead. And, or like, at the beginning, uh, Finding Nemo starts with like, your whole family is dead. So that's like pretty rough. But it's not like the whole movie is the character grappling with that. It's sort of just like the the thing that pushes the story into motion. So I think that we've pr pretty much expressed what the, um, or at, at least I hope that I've expressed what the, the challenges of this would be. But as far as the pitch goes, I mean, you're, it's, it, you've done a good job pitching it. I, I think that it's just like what you're pitching might just be kind of outside of most people's usual taste palette, or it might be outside of most people's experience of like, they might not hear that and be like, Oh, I've got to check that out because that's what—that's ultimately what the feeling is that you want to create, right? Like that's—that's that's the reaction we want from anybody is that you'll tell it, you'll tell the idea to someone, and they'll be like, "Oh, I can't wait to sign up for that to to see that." Um, so maybe if you've gotten that reaction from other people, that's a good sign. I mean, if you have gotten like really excited responses, or or some people have been really eager to see how you pull that off, then it's a sign you're doing something correctly at the very least. So have, would you say you've gotten kind of like mostly positive mo or mostly mixed reactions to this? Um, I have, uh, I've actually asked that question to uh, beta readers mm -hmm. and they said it would not work as a uh, human story. It, it just loses uh, the magic one, because one of the main things she is dealing with is uh, she is in a society where flight is normal. Everything is built around flight and now she can't fly. So that is one um, 
one small aspect. It centers about around the um, the family, the relationships of the family. So I have asked uh, if they if people thought that it would work as just turning everyone human and making some tweaks and stuff. And said no, no, it wouldn't work. And um, I I just want to mention uh, Lion King is a very, very human story. In fact, it is a rewrite of Hamlet, which is, well, stars people. Mm -hmm. So it does work to have animals telling a human story. Um, but, in, in fact, the Lion King kind of a big adventure where we have to travel across the savanna and, like, your characters are getting away from stampedes and fighting these evil hyenas and they're, like, doing things that would fit more into the adventure genre than the drama genre, for instance, wouldn't you say? But it's still based on a Shakespearean play. Right. That's true. I mean, yeah, like... At, at the core of it, it is still a Shakespearean play. Okay. Yes, that is the case. Um, okay, so I hope that that at least, um, you know, might give you some things to think about in terms of how to to pitch something and like how to some just things to think about for the story itself there is always this factor of if it's something you've already written then it might be like well i can't change those because i can't change the pitch because then i have to change the movie so that's just going to be the danger of like bringing something you've already written to a, a pitching class so just something to keep in mind for anybody it's like um it's always easier to change the idea early on if you have not gone through to write the whole thing yet so if you have to choose between I have something that's done and something that I haven't written yet. I would recommend usually going with a thing that you have not written yet. Um, and Micah says, pitch it to Disney or Cartoon Network. Yeah, there you go. Yep, you caught the acronym. Anyway. Eh. I think, yeah, Cartoon Network, it's got to be. Okay. Yeah, and, you, and you've probably read my, uh, my, my idea for the first episode of uh, my take on Runaways, which is different from the official MCU, maybe... Who knows if it'll still be MCU by the time? I hope. I hope they'll consider making it. I don't know. Anyway. Well, we can't do fan fiction scripts out. usually, so let's try to focus on original ideas. Yeah. Um, that they can f they can feature public domain characters like Helen of Troy, for instance, or mythological figures, or yeah. you know, like public domain characters are totally uh, fine. But we shouldn't usually be trying to pitch things with characters that we don't own the rights to. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how how to get this. Yeah, I I had this great idea for how to do it, but yeah, Marvel might not probably won't listen until I've got a few more scripts down. Finish Helen first, and then I agree. Yeah, okay. But so there's so much good alien conling stuff in this. Oh my god, you, you you're <laughs> okay. So uh, we yeah, have to wrap up here because we're at the end of our time. But uh, thank you for participating. Bukari Valizu excrement of large horned creatures. Goodness. Okay. Well, that might be something that comes up in that script. Um, for now, we that, have that's to... something that comes up. Yeah. Okay. We'll have to save I mean... it for the next class because we're yeah. wrapping up now. We're at the end of our time. But if you want to sign up for the course, remember, uh, scriptcamp.net slash membership gets you a free trial for two weeks. That will include the first and second that's half of this entire class um so make sure to sign up before the class starts to get you know as much possible time out of that membership but you do have to sign up before showing up so uh scriptcamp.net slash membership or slash classes if you want to just buy the course on its own um we have some stuff coming up as well and nacho feel free to also um mention or plug anything that we have um so if you plan to enroll but haven't signed up on the website, uh, you can click the check emoji in the chat to get access to the bootcamp channels and to join the discussion. Nacho, do you have a, a thing for them to click on there? Yeah, we'll have it in the chat for just a second. So if you're in the Discord right now, then um, feel free to just find Nacho's little message and click on it. Or I'll just, I can just drop one right here if we need. Click here. And I'll put the little emoji there. There it is. So just click that if you plan to sign up um, and you can get access to the chat channels right away. Um, so uh, what else? We have t-shirts. Send Nacho a message with your size and mailing address. You can get a free shirt for Script Camp like this. 
Um, Writer's Lab is Saturdays, 4 to 6. It's like office hours with any questions you have or any topics you just want to hear more about. Any scripts that you need a few pages looked at or you want an outline checked over. We have a referral program too. If you refer a friend, you will get a free month of membership and they will get a discount. You can do that again and again. So if you have friends you think might like this, get them in and you will get free months of membership. Um, we have table reads later today, Sunday at uh, 4 o'clock. Bring up to five pages of a script to read it with the group and get feedback on it. We have workshops and classes Wednesday and Thursday, 4 to 7. Next rewrite boot camp starts free intro April 9th. That's 12 to 2 on Saturday. Feature boot camp is Fridays, 4 to 6. We have two classes left in the session before the new one starts. So in just two weeks, or like, or so, sorry, three weeks from now, um, come by for a brand new feature camp. Playwriting camp is brand new. Saturdays 12, I'm sorry, Saturdays 2 to 4. Pitch boot camp is this one, Sundays 11 to 1 for the next four weeks. And we have TV pilot. This course starts May 8th. That's Sundays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. So uh, make sure to sign up and you can get access to all of those with Unlimited. Um, thanks for coming in, everyone, and thanks for pitching. I know it's tough to, uh, you know, if, get over the stage fright and to, like, communicate ideas, especially if they're not totally ready. So try to refine them as much as possible for next week using everything we talked about today. Watch that video that I linked before of the previous pitch workshop if you want to get a really good recording of many people doing the exact same type of stuff and hear the comments that me and Scott have on all their, uh, all their ideas. Um, any last questions before we call class for today? Does the person who is leaving weird spam in our uh, YouTube chat want to weigh in? I'm just kidding, by the way. Soul and a half, do you have a question? Maybe not. Okay. Um, so we are going to wrap up today's class. Thanks for coming by. Remember, scriptcant.net slash membership. You can sign up and uh, get access to classes like this and the many other great ones that we're going to be adding soon. So thank you for coming. We'll see you all soon around the server.